Good evening. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's symposium, Havana, LA, Havana. Um, I'm Marceline Gao, uh, Design and Cultural Studies faculty here at SciArc and principal of Servo Los Angeles. Tonight's symposium explores contemporary architecture in Cuba, envisioning possibilities for the future of Havana's built environment and encouraging a renewed cultural and artistic exchange between Cuba and the US. Th this event takes the form of a conversation between architects, scholars, historians, and curators from Cuba and the United States. The symposium presents the work and influences of the current generation of architects and artists working in Havana and considers the future of Havana's urban landscape and the architecture that will be designed and built in the context of the current transformations occurring in Cuba. So before handing over the floor to Ramiro Diaz Granados, who will give an introduction to this event, um, we'd like to thank SciArc for hosting the event and to extend a special thanks to the Graham Foundation for advanced studies in the fine arts, who generously supported the symposium, as well as the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs for their ongoing support of SciArc's public programs. I will now introduce our visiting panelists. Um, tonight we have four speakers with us, um, our, our fifth speaker, unfortunately, very sadly, uh, cannot be here tonight due to a delay in processing his visa. Um, this is the architect, architectural and historian and critic, Eduardo Luis Rodriguez, who we will uh, sadly miss tonight on the panel. Hopefully, he's able to watch us on video. Um, um, unlikely. His colleague, uh, Belmont Freeman, who also uh, co-curated an exhibition at the Storefront for Art and Architecture, uh, Architecture and Revolution in Cuba, 1959 to 1969, is happily here um, with us tonight. Belmont Freeman is the principal of Belmont Freeman Architects and a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. He has earned a wide reputation as an innovative designer, a progressive practitioner, and a scholar. His work is regularly featured in the architecture and design press, he has received numerous awards from the American Institute of Architects, the American Society of Interior Designers, and other professional and civic organizations. Mr. Freeman's client list includes major universities and cultural institutions, as well as corporations, developers, and private residential clients. He is an adjunct associate professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architectural Planning and Preservation, where he teaches a design studio within the Historic Preservation Program. Mr. Freeman was the president of the board of directors of Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York City from 1998 to 2007. He lectures widely and has served on the board of directors of the Society of Architectural Historians and on the board of governors of the Association of Yale Alumni. An American of Cuban descent, Mr. Freeman is regarded as an expert on Cuban architecture, a subject on which he speaks and publishes widely. Um, as I said, in 2004, he co-produced the exhibition Architecture and Revolution in Cuba at Storefront, and he has led several celebrated architectural tours of Cuba. Um, our next speaker will be Universo Garcia Lorenzo. Uh, Mr. Lorenzo is a Cuban architect. He is the lead architect and project director at the ATRIO at the Ministry of Culture. Mr. Lorenzo is an assistant professor at the Department of Design Faculty of Architecture, ISPJE, in Havana, where he is the advisor and tutor of the graduate thesis project, as well as responsible for postgraduate training. He is a member of the Cuban Writers and Artists National Union and the Cuban Construction Architects and Engineers National Union. His architectural work in Cuba includes the remodeling of the National Hotel of Cuba in Havana, the restoration of Hotel Telegrafo, Havana, projects for individual high standard housing and private hostels in Old Havana, as well as a project for the restoration, rebuilding, and proposal of new facilities for the National Art School in Cubanacan, Havana City, uh, an, a, a long ongoing project from 2000 to 2010, a decade of work on that. Mr. Lorenzo has received awards for the best project and constructive work with recognition by the Havana City Government for the restoration and upgrading of the National Hotel and the Hotel Telegrafo, 
and also recognition by the National Council of Cultural Heritage for the restoration of the National Art Schools, specifically the rehabilitation of Ricardo Poro's uh, schools. Holly Block, our third speaker. Uh, Holly Block is the director of the Bronx Museum of Arts, where she previously served as curator before gaining an international reputation as a director, curator, and arts administrator. Ms. Block was also the executive director of Art in General, a leading nonprofit organization, um, arts organization dedicated to commissioning and presenting contemporary art. She also served as co-commissioner for the Department of State for the 2003 Cairo Biennial. Ms. Block is the author of Art Cuba, The New Generation, a comprehensive survey on contemporary art from Cuba. And she organized Todo Clandestino, Todo Popular, the first solo exhibition of Cuban artist Alberto Casado. Block oversaw the 2011 launch of Smart Power, a fellowship program managed by the Bronx Museum of the Arts and made possible by the US Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs which enabled US artists to work with youth and local artists in sites around the world. In 2013, Ms. Block was appointed co-commissioner of the United States Pavilion at the 55th Venice Biennale. During her 18 years at Art in General, Ms. Block exhibited and presented the work of over 4,000 artists. Known for having initiated new evolving contemporary arts programming, such as Art in General's International Artist Residency Program and its new commission program, Ms. Block has been a dynamic force in the contemporary art world and is a firm believer in the arts and their impact on today's society. And our fourth speaker, Claudio Vextein. Claudio Vextein is principal of ECV, Opera Publica, 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 based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He is professor of architecture, landscape architecture, and urban design at the design school, Arizona State University. His constructive public works include, to name just a few, uh, the memorial to the Alcorta uprising, the Montessori School in Lujan, the Mill Cultural Factory in Santa Fe, the Memorial Square to Ernesto Guevara in Rosario, the Forum for Arts and Sciences, River Coast Park, Amphitheater and Monument in homage to Amancio Williams in Vicente Lopez, as well as access to the Ernesto de la Karkova Museum, an extension for the Fine Arts School in Buenos Aires. He has also completed projects in the USA, Cuba, Paraguay, and Venezuela. Mr. Vexton has received numerous honors for his work, including awards from the Stiftung Städelschule in Frankfurt, the International Center for Preservation of Architectural Heritage, the Architects Central Society of Argentina, and the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture. His work has been published and exhibited internationally. Mr. Vexstein was the last disciple of South American master architect Amancio Williams. He completed master studies at the Städelschule Academy of Arts in Frankfurt under professors Enrique Morales and Peter Cook, and undergraduate studies at the School of Architecture, Design, and Urbanism in Buenos Aires University. Um, these are our presenters, and I'll just extremely briefly, in the interest of time, introduce there are uh, four SIARC faculty, including myself, who will be engaged in the conversation. Um, Florencia Pita, uh, SIARC Design Visual Studies and Undergrad Thesis faculty and principal of Pita and Bloom. Ramiro Diaz Granados, SIARC Design and Visual Studies faculty and principal of Amorphous. Dwayne Euler, SIARC Design faculty and undergraduate thesis coordinator, principal of Euler Wu Collaborative. So with that, I will hand over to Ramiro. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, my, my intro is gonna be a kind of uh, uh, partly in honor of Eduardo Rodriguez, who couldn't make it. Um, because I was interested in, in this book, which is his guide of modern architecture, uh, pseudo kind of pre-Castro. Um, and so he, he couldn't make it because of visa issues in relationship to the US special interests um, agency, uh, which, is, which used to be the embassy. So what I wanna talk about is the brief history, uh, a kind of parafactual account of this building and the site immediately around it. 
Um, so this is a 50s aerial photo of Havana and the U.S. Embassy is right there. So this is the Malecon and you can see a kind of uh, uh, typically landscaped islands in between those things. So this becomes a kind of site of, of, of um, relations between U.S. And, and Cuba that go from imperialistic humiliation, hostility, and awkwardness. Uh, so in, in President Obama's speech in December 2014 on laying out a plan for normalizing relations with Cuba, he stated that the U.S. will reestablish its embassy in Havana. Uh, this building, designed by Wallace Harrison and Max Abramovitz in 1950, was part of a broader embassies project commissioned by the U.S. State Department in the aftermath of World War II. Uh, it was meant to use modern architecture to project an imperialist image as a triumphant superpower. Uh, in addition to this imperialist image, uh, many of the construction materials were donated by European countries as a means to pay off their war debt. So we kind of move from uh, this idea of the building as a kind of image of imperialism. It opens in 1953. In 1961, the U.S. pulls out in response to Cuban accusations of it being used as a U.S. espionage base. Uh, in 1977, Jimmy Carter uh, reopens it as the U.S. interest section, uh, which is basically a lesser status uh, agency than an embassy. Um, so this was part of his moves to um, improve relations. So the building failed. Uh, there's, uh, it failed in its attempt to use, uh, to implement its kind of modernist image by not taking into account local climate, which is a a major condition there and which uh, Eduardo talks about in his Havana Guide in terms of how modern architecture uh, implemented in Cuba addressed local climate, which is severe tropics. Um, in this case, the, the, this building had to be renovated, which they did in 97. Uh, so what you're seeing is a whole mechanical upgrade. So on the roof, there's a whole series of mechanical equipment, the screening of that, and then on the left here, a whole plenum that feeds all those lines down, and then you also get this. So the kind of handsome imperialistic image of the initial architecture is completely undermined by this. Uh, now, in 2000, the Cuban government constructs the Plaza de la Dignidad and the anti-imperialist platform, uh, which is read anti-US platform. Uh, while the star shape of the platform which you can see, here's the embassy, here's the platform, uh, uh, comes from the Cuban flag. It can also be read as a graphic punch aimed at the embassy, a la the kitsch uh, references of pop culture. Um, now, in 2006, under the Bush administration, uh, the U.S. installs an electronic billboard across the facade that flashes human rights messages. So what does Cuba do? They erect 138 flags between the building and the anti-imperialist platform to visually block its messages. So we can see that now we're in a hostile state. Uh, uh, and then finally, I want to end on this one. Um, this, you guys, you're familiar with this? This is uh, in 2005, the late grunge band Audio Slave plays a free concert in the plaza and becomes the first American rock group to play in Cuba. So what looks like a typical rock star audience frenzied engagement is actually a culturally awkward moment. Tom Morello, who used to be in Rage Against the Machine, this is basically Rage Against the Machine with lead singer of Soundgarden, uh, he's actually signaling to a technician because they were having tech audio problems so a slave, to, you know, so there's a whole series of, of puns that we can play on here. But he was actually signaling because they were having problems. The audience thought it was a signal to kind of unite in a typical rock <laughs> frenzied moment. Um, so what you have here is this culturally awkward condition, which um, I think is actually a, a, a way forward in terms of embracing this cultural awkwardness. I mean, hopefully in the discussion we'll get at uh, what that might mean, but I think there are certain questions 
that I had in terms of how, how do you update the U.S. Embassy? Like, what are the strategies to renovate or update this project? Uh, seemed to be an interesting question. One that I wanted to pose to Eduardo, um, and also the question of how, how would he, or what would his book look like in 50 years? What does he imagine the next wave of, of architecture in his, in his guide? Um, so with that said, uh, who's our first speaker? Oh, you're clapping. Oh, Belmont. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Marceline and uh, Ramiro and Cy Arc. I'm very pleased to be here. It included in this um, this uh, which, which event, which I'm sure will be very stimulating. I, do, I really don't know how it's going to play out, since each of the four of us is probably going to present a very uh, different uh, mini presentation to you. But um, here we go. Um, I, I'd also like to, to second um, Ramiro's regret that Eduardo Luis Rodriguez, my close friend and colleague, can't be here. And just in case anybody missed it, had nothing to do with the Cuban government, it was the US government that held up his visa, uh, somewhat sadistically granting him a visa um, for right after this conference and right after the opening of the Latin American Modern Show at MoMA, for which he curated the Cuba section and the related symposium. They gave him a visa to start the day after the symposium. I don't know why utterly reprehensible, arbitrary uh, treatment of a scholar of his stature is mind-boggling, but I certainly hope that with the someday maybe restoration of uh, diplomatic ties between our two countries that this kind of nonsense will uh, finish. <clears throat> um, this is a view of Havana from a high point in El Verado. You can see the, um, the Hotel Nacional on the left. The lower right hand corner is the recently restored Hotel Capri, one of the greatest of the 50s uh, gangster hotels. Central Havana in the middle, the mouth of Havana Harbor in the distance, El Morro, Castillo del Morro, uh, guarding the, the, the uh, harbor, and in the far distance, uh, the 1960s nuke town of Havana del Este. Shortly before he died, just a, a couple months before he died, the, uh, I was having a conversation with the great um, architect um, Mario Coyula Crowley, who was for many years the head of um, planning for the city of Havana. And he told me that uh, he, was, he was in a rather despondent mood about the fate of his beloved city. And he said that Havana was poised between two equally mortal fates. One is the lack of money, which is the present condition, i.e. the lack of resources to prevent the total collapse of the city, because it is crumbling on, before our eyes. But equally dangerous was the prospect of too much money too fast, which could destroy the city in another way. And this um, danger, this was, this was, he was talking right before the announcements of the detente between Cuba and the US, and these new fears of uh, a flood of North American investment coming into Havana and wreaking havoc. And I have a lot of friends and colleagues and I get a little annoyed when people say they want to rush to Havana to, to see it before it changes. We have to recognize that Havana will change. It has to change or else the city will fall apart, but also more importantly just for the betterment of the Cuban people who need and deserve a, a better life. Um, this is a view up and down along the um, Malecon, which is sort of the character defining, defining oceanfront boulevard of uh, Havana, developed in the early part of the 20th century. And it's, it's rather emblematic of the condition of the urban fabric in Havana. 
So you can see this eclectic mix of early 20th century um, mansions, uh, 1920 hotel, occasional fanciful 1950 high rises, but lots of gaps in the, in the, in the smile of the city, a lot of vacant lots. Um, now I was, several years ago, 2000, 2002, I was at a symposium in um, Havana at which um, Andres Duani made a presentation in which he had made the sort of astonishing assertion that in his opinion, every vacant lot in Havana should be redeveloped only with a replica of the building that existed there before. Um, his, his philosophical rationale for this was that the collapse of buildings in Havana was not deliberate, what was a, the cause of some kind of entropy that should be reversed. This, this concept didn't go over real well with the mostly Cuban audience. There's a lot of people, foreigners, who um, most, for the most part, who would like to see their Havana sort of preserved as a, as a, as a, as a timepiece, preserved in amber. Well, that's kind of, um, an, to me, an, an insulting um, attitude to take towards a city that's, that's vital and vibrant and has always um, been a very cosmopolitan society, uh, welcoming of outside influences, artistic and cultural and political. And um, I, would, I, I think that from the viewpoint of sort of historic preservation and contemporary design, I, will ho I would hope that Havana and uh, those architects and policymakers who rebuild the city can um, integrate a, a progressive sense of historic preservation with modern design going forward. Because after all, at the, on, the, on the cusp of the, on the eve of the revolution, Havana was arguably one of the most modern cities in um, Latin America, certainly in the Caribbean. And I see no reason why that tradition of embracing the latest and uh, of, of contemporary uh, architecture uh, should not continue into the future. Another very, um, I'd say, you know, again, character defining features of the, of the city of Havana is Havana Harbor, Havana, the Havana Bay, um, which is the largest and um, most defensible harbor in the Caribbean. It's really Havana's raison d'etre. That's why the city is there. Here you see the entrance to the harbor by the uh, Morro Castle. Um, we have to reflect upon a, a lot of the good things that happened because of the revolution. If, if the, I'm sure that if the revolution had not occurred, like so many other cities, New York City, Boston, San Francisco, there would have been an elevated highway all the way along here built sometime in the 60s, but that didn't happen in Havana. So we, Havana has the blessing of, of at least not having to undo a lot of the um, ill-advised urban renewal type schemes that afflicted a lot of other cities in, in, in the Americas. So the, the urban fabric is, even though it's, you know, it's quite uh, deteriorated and uh, shabby, is generally intact, which is a marvelous as we contemplate uh, the hopeful revival of the, of, of, of the economy in Cuba at least it's starting from um, a good a ground plane. Um, another, um, and, and I'm sure that the, 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 the harbor is the subject of a lot of design studies going on right now, some of them quite dubious to my mind, but you know, it's gonna happen, something is gonna happen. The, the, the harbor, Havana Harbor will inevitably, and for good reason, become, I predict, the center of the new Havana for the 21st century. Uh, because it, it, it no longer, the, it, it's presently 
um, surrounded by a lot of uh, obsolete industrial installations. Um, I'm sure the future of Havana Harbor will be more along the lines of uh, cultural uh, installations and tourism. And one blessing um, that Havana uh, Harbor enjoys is that the mouth of the harbor and the elevation of the tunnel underneath it is too shallow to allow the mega cruise ships to get in. We were, a lot of us were in Venice a few, you know, a um, couple months ago, or, or back in the, over the dirt for the Biennale, you know, it's so appalled by these, you know, these cruise ships that just dwarf the city of Venice. Well, you can see the first of, the, of Havana's three um, ocean liner terminals here has been restored, and all, only these small cruise ships can get in. Now, they say that revolution is construction, but in, the truth of the matter is that there just simply hasn't been that much new construction in Havana in the last couple of decades. Uh, historic preservation and, and renovation is much more, is, is the, the, the biggest game in town. And while well, the, the uh, government, through the Office of the Historian of the City of Havana, has been the leader in uh, most of the historic preservation and renovation efforts, mostly focusing on old Havana, dealing, rehabilitating the major monuments, and uh, <clears throat> turning a lot of venerable old buildings into hotels to support the tourism trade. There's also been a lot of um, resources invested in just sort of the background buildings of old Havana. These are two slides that I took myself, um, you know, over a decade apart, showing Plaza Vieja in the heart of old Havana, and uh, these are the same three buildings. Now I know that this one is a, is a restaurant and a, a, a bar, Beer hall, yes, yeah, it's, a, it's a beer hall. These are, these are residential. You know, there, there's a program in which people are taken out of uh, dilapidated old buildings in old Havana. Restoration is, is, is performed. They're moved back in. There's a lot of that kind of activity there. So it's, you see it's sort of the uh, confluence of housing policy and um, historic preservation that can perhaps only exist in a socialist country. Um, one area of interest that the Office of the City Historian has not taken up very enthusiastically or with great uh, attention is the uh, rehabilitation of Havana's remarkable modernist ar architecture legacy. But some of that slack at an interesting level is being picked up on the private sector. And we see um, in these neighborhoods, Havana has a collection of modernist houses that's as good as Los Angeles's, and um, in, you know, entire neighborhoods of fantastic houses, uh, of entire environments of modernism, and uh, this happens to be one house with which I'm very familiar. It belongs to some friends of mine, and I think Universo. Trabajaste en esta casa con No, no. Okay, but uh, th this couple um, as assiduously restored. Um, a house by Frank Martinez, who is one of the great modernists of the 1950s and into the 60s. He stayed after the revolution and worked for a decade um, um, after the revolution. And have, they've restored this exquisite house. And they are representatives of an interesting social phenomenon of a new entrepreneurial class that is evolving in Cuba, in Havana in particular since the um, relaxation of regulations on private enterprise that, was, that have been promulgated by Raul Castro after Fidel retired. So you're getting this growth of an entrepreneurial class that is undertaking a lot of interesting projects. And so there's a, a, a nascent clientele for architecture in Havana. But the contrast is still quite stark. Just a couple of blocks away is one of the best houses by Mario Romagnac, who was the consummate, um, the leader of the, of, the, of the generation of the 1950s. Actually was a prof professor of mine at University of Pennsylvania. The, 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 the um, font house 
you can see the original and as it is now in its present rather you know compromised condition it's it does house five families so you know it's a complicated issue I mean, I think I'm going to shoot the next historic preservationist who come, goes to Cuba, comes back to New York and says, oh, it's so sad. There are all these beautiful mansions that are chopped up into apartments occupied by poor people. You know? We can't look at it that way. Now, we're... Um, there's sort of a narcissistic um, attention being paid from the United States about when you know North American developers can are going to flood into um, Havana and, um, and 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 transform the city with their projects. We forget that there have been European and Canadian developers who've been trying to build projects in in Cuba and in Havana for decades. And they have been uh, persistently vexed by the sort of sclerotic bureaucracy of the Cuban government and their um, obsession with controlling every aspect of economic activity. And so there are endless projects that, that just sort of are frustrated and never get anywhere. So there's a lot of change that's going to have to happen on the part of the Cuban government um, to enable development, whether it's enlightened or not. This is one particularly prominent site in Havana, the old Hotel Packard site that's been in the state of ruin for as long as I can remember. There was, I was told, a, a plan designed by Rafael Moneo for a hotel on this site that would have been, a lot of my friends in the architectural community in Havana were quite excited about having uh, a really good architect doing a, a project on a major site here, but the developers just got frustrated with all of the changes in the rules and the change of the deal, you know, that they gave up. So the building is still a ruin. And uh, finally, the other obstacle to new construction, new design development in Havana is just the deplorable state of the infrastructure. The sewer system hasn't had any major upgrades, you know, since the 19-teens. The water system reportedly loses half of its uh, drinking water supply through leakage, blackouts, apagones are a daily, you know, part of life in Havana. So there is a, there is a lot of work going on. The upper left is a, is a new sort of showpiece construction on the, on the, on the harbor that's part of the um, sewage treatment and ejection system. And here on the lower right, you can see them installing new, new utilities in, in Old Havana. Um, so they say that with the opening of, of, of uh, US tourism to Havana, they're going to need you know, thousands of new hotel rooms. But presently, the, 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 the uh, infrastructure of utilities is, is not there to support that. So, to my friends who say they want to rush to Cuba to see, see it before it changes, I say, you know, you've got time. There's, it's going to be a challenge. So it's, it's, a, it's a long process that's going to be unfolding, but uh, an exciting one to, uh, to watch. Thank you. Good evening. First, I'd like to thank the organizer of the symposium for the possibility of being here with you and for first time being in America, in the States, and for receiving, <laughs> even, even for receiving five year visa so I could back anywhere. Well, I decided to uh, call my presentation Emptiness, Verticality, and Continuity. Projected Utopias, Skyscrapers, Invedado. 
Ben Joseph Untual, but a standing reference in the recent past evolution of the architecture in Cuba, I consider interesting for this symposium in one avant-gardist institution like the Southern California Institute of Architecture, dedicated to Havana, LA, Havana, to propose an approach to the case of the tall buildings in Havana as a relevant landmark of the cultural environment on the Cuban capital. Havana is an almost 500 years old city, one of the most important ports and commercial destinations in the Caribbean area. This presentation concerns the vision of a city's problematic from the academic projections and interaction with. Ebedado is the modern area in the city, intensively developed in the first half of the past century, and the center area close to the sea received in each urban grid in the 1950s, the final re relocation of the public and government functions from the whole city and the intensive apartment investment promoting the concentration of the rational skyscrapers. In 1959, in less than 50 years, El Vedado, the modern seafront border, had conquered the sky. The first half of the 20th century and the 1950s left us an invaluable architectonic heritage, a personal creative and an iconic assimilation of international style involving Cuban young architects, but also North American partners. But many years after the revolution of 1959, the constructive effort of the government were focused in the development of the country areas and in the several programs for health, education, social housing, with a very limited follow it approach to the integral quality of a city. Economic limitations were followed by the lack of maintenance and very poor constructive intervention in the capital city, without a consistent integral visualized and up-to-date master plan. From one side, about 50 years of stagnation in the evolution of the avant-garde urban and architectural practice, even punctual attempts were incorporated in some cities' landscape and from the other side, the progressive deterioration of the existing buildings, including the icons of that period. Havana has to be preserved, renovated, reused, responded over its existing territory, but limiting as much as possible new necessary expansion. This slide shows identified laws for top buildings according to the urban strategy of the city plan regulation for Vedado. Based on this work, as a subject of uh, the urban architectonic intervention in the Havana city, the concept of emptiness represents various categories. First, lost, lots of collapsed historic buildings, ruins of a still standing deteriorated buildings, never occupied lots in the existing urban grid, spontaneous grown disqualified areas, all of them in different proportions, independence of what sector of the city we analyze, old, central, modern Havana. But also, this could mean a new concept, an innovative projection over the disintegral problem. Counting with this list of identified lots for top buildings, according with this urban strategy of a city plan regulation for Vedado, allows even for new issues certainly when would be possible to reinitiate the systemic design process and construction, including new buildings, at least to improve a preliminary creative research about this relevant issue. The current curricular urban and architectonic academic design exercises in the Faculty of Architecture in Havana are focused to envisage probably future ascents in different contextual situations, specifically, in the third course, the workshops at the same time introduce students in the complexity of a tall public buildings for different mixed functional programs, hotels, offices, convention centers, academic institutions, others, but focus the attention in the some important points. 
the improvement of an experimental futuristic self-conscious search method, the utopic appropriation of the recent past with a realistic, realist, realistic vision of the political and socioeconomic national environment, to develop a personal vision about identity, leaving aside those conservative visions about past styles and cultural image for more consequence with the contemporaneity ways of creation in our context. To illustrate in different free creative approaches the continuity of the necessary inclusion of the new thought buildings. The urban structure of Bedado is based in practically perfect reticular nets of 100 meters block with white street, gardens, park, and exceptional location in the seafront with privileged views. The structure, identified by several important urban axes, with the concentration of the administrative, art, cultural, educational, touristic functions, provides an excellent layout to experiment. The following slides will show a selection of the most interesting student work envisaging the future of Vedado with new skyscrapers complementing its context. New Gate is a project that searches in the relationships with the bay and the sea, with a profound interest in a climate consideration, proposing a new icon in the border, and the concept of openness, concrete, steel, and blue glass express connection with the reference of the 1950s, seeking for new, more flexible codes. Route silhouettes, focus designed in the relationship with landscape, influenced by the climate specifications and in the use of sustainable energies, trying to establish a new icon in the important axis of the 23th Street. Green textures, follows the studies about the nexus with the environment, the creative appropriation of a green walls, helping the climate solutions with self energy technologies is an idea of a more flexible urban landscape, but still creating a new icon in the 23rd Street. <coughs> Modeling ideals, curves, assumes the creative challenge of architecture, but also traspasses the pre-established ideals of rationality, modeling new shapes in steel and glass, considering the use of energies provided by, for breezes, lights, is an unusual artistic approach to the cultural transcendence of the site. Moving on to a search of the new face of the seafront border. Havana is the major responsibility city in the Antilles. Its future passes through the acceptance in the necessary modernization and critically adapting the architectonic typologies of the existing functions. Was Roberto Segre, the architect and historian, the founder of the Faculty of Historia Theoretic at the School of Architecture in Havana after revolution, who considered, philosophically speaking, the necessity of modernizing the city, and specifically, Bedado. Following slides shows more individual and free interpretation of this issue. Sea transportations. It is possible to be a part of the presence and influence of the sea. And from other point of view, from the importance of the seafront skyline, which is needs in new icons. From idiosyncrasy to acting to projections, lights, materials, pedestrian life, transparency, creating permeable aerodynamic structures. Breaking with the previous typologies, experimenting with contemporaneity, new shapes, new symbols.
the sea wave, another door openness, free creation, all of them dreams. We are dreaming more than 50 years about the continuity of architecture, about bridges, about connections, about new, new public spaces, filling the emptiness, providing the new society of modern, more capable spaces for interchange in the urban life. But that is the center of the cultural, administrative, of the interchange life, all of the capital. Bridges. These two projects go deeply in the analysis of the urban connections with the use of sustainable technologies and its nexus with the urban nature and spirit. Broadcasting. In Bedado are concentrates most of the broadcasting TV, radio in Havana. This spirit promotes another influence in our dreams. Other artistic approaches to the urban speciality. First projects place with urban dynamics and meanings like tunnels, slenderness, hierarchies, chaos, noises, reflections, all that resumes the heart of a city in Vedado. Second project more profound in the search goes deeply into the cultural and artistic atmosphere of the 50s and in the 60s, identifying the icons of that time from where grows and arises the new image of the city in La Rampa. This proposal is a very creative way, tries to find a solid contact between the Central Havana and Modern Vedado in front of the sea in the confluence of the axis, appropriating the symbolic use of bamboo and textile skins with graphic and mural surface and more revolutionary use of lighting technologies. The 60s, according to the expression of Graciela Pogolotti, a critic historian, visual arts threw into the city. To the painter's talents was added the explosion of the graphic posters. Art was incorporated to the routine of everyday life. As the open and flexible space, Pabellón Cuba, were shown with splendid art expositions, May Saloon brought the newest fashion from Paris. Pabellón Cuba, Pabellón Cuba was built in 1963 for the International Congress of Architects and resumed the whole euphoria of that period with everything seems to be possible in every kind of space, in art, in construction, in architecture. The construction of a past no pre-established models. The new epicenter for La Rampa, a process for the city, a scenario for culture. This is the body of visation, the Pavilion Cuba and La Rampa. Breaking time before stagnation. I try to resume to synthesize some uh, ideas concerning the concepts we handled with the students in our workshops concerning identity research from the past to the future. In 1963 was built the Pavilion Cuba for the International Congress of Architects in Havana. This space, created with the idea of a free interchange of youths with culture and city, became a symbol of the breaking times after when practically was stopped the evolution of the avant-gardist architecture. Where is present? in the past, there is a future. The way from the detachment, considering the destination, new users from the city, contemporary men and cultural phenomenon of their environment, new visions, buildings is defined itself considering three visions, cultural scenario, processes, 
epicenter. This is totally new concept in which verticality becomes horizontality. No more spaces, no more emptiness claim for verticality. There is a huge spaces that are occupied in the middle of the iconic skyscraper. A student tried to lead them with the importance of the previous architecture, with the requirements of the specific location in the heart of the rampa, in the heart of Bedado. And this concept trying to represent somehow another way of leading with that issue. I decided to finish the presentation with some works developed by former students, recent graduated students, already practicing in Havana. They don't left, they don't leave the country, they try to practice in Havana, they work at the government offices, fighting with difficulties, fighting with bureaucracy, fighting with the fact that we are not building nothing new that works, but still dreaming in the possible future. After graduation in the faculty, for those architects that stay practicing in Cuba, no matter the quite limited field of action for architecture, the issues concerning the future of a city continuing in the focus of interest. Final slides show the conceptual ideas developed in a brainstorming context with the participation of some young architects working in the government design offices. Reflections of the urban landscape. In the same car of La Rampa in 23, 23rd Street. This work somehow shows the preoccupation about the continuity of the spaces and speciality in the urban axis, characterize this design context. A new tower to shield a ramp up. Havana does need new tall buildings as an urban necessity, because especially organized the city and emphasized the center, but just as absence, not like generality. La Rampa is dying, but not because it's age. That says Leonardo Padura and La Rampa, natural deaths of premeditated assassinates. To acquire a realistic conscience to confront verticality is a priority in a hard city. That said, Pedro Albizu Camposel in his book, Edificio Alto. Some of its implication was reviewed the Comomo Cuba in 2006. Finally, Bedado somehow represents the whole city. And the whole Havana does need a radical, critical, and flexible reformulation. Not only getting into a focus, it's urban, architectonic ways of renaissance, succeeding the still cautious, but potentially growing to an expected climate, the economic and social opening, up to the new form of national or foreign investment and a decentralized management of the local resources. But this reformulation involves all related spheres of our cultural environment, which politically means, first, the official recognition of the role of the architecture and the architects for the everyday Cuban society, allowing the inclusion in the government decisions concerning urban planning and construction. Second, the consolidation of a professional education, involving students in the developed programs in any scale in the city as the basic creative support with the new fresh projection under the leadership of recognized architects linked with the school. In consequence, most be upgrade the constructive technologies to assume the challenge of modernization of a city, expanding the possibility of good qualities constructive materials, which is a huge limitation. The technical training of a constructive workers on required loose constructive skills, 
which precisely made remarkable the previous periods before the crisis. The possibility of the continuity is in our hands. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you again for inviting me. <clears throat> the invitation came from, I also want, excuse me. <clears throat> the invitation came from Andro Zago and Stephanie Atlan and then uh, Abby Schwarrier. And I also wanted to thank my fellow panelists. Uh, Eduardo Luis, we miss him. Uh, I've learned much from him over the years, and um, I'm actually quite um, disappointed he's not here as well. Uh, first, I'm going to start by sharing some information. First is that I'm not Cuban. I have uh, traveled to Cuba for tw more than 21 years. Um, I also extend a great uh, thanks to my continued education about Havana through all the artists that I've met over the years, architects and scholars. And it really wouldn't be without them uh, for you know, sharing their information. So I've organized many exhibitions, selected artists for residencies, awards, written on art from Cuba, and I'm also the author of a book uh, that was published by Abrams in 2001. And uh, when asked to speak tonight about uh, this particular exhibition that the Bronx Museum is actually undertaking, it's called Wild Noise. Wild Noise is from a poem of Victor Hugo. Uh, this is a collaboration between two institutions, the Museo Nacional, uh, Bellas Artes in Havana, and uh, the Bronx Museum. In Havana, we will be having this exchange program, and there'll be almost 90 art artworks that will uh, be exhibited from the Bronx Museum's permanent collection. It will open in Havana on May 21st. It will be the first time an exchange like this will have occurred. Uh, and uh, the National Museum's collection will come to the United States in March of 2016. So I hope you will travel to the Bronx to visit both uh, exhibitions. I'm, I'm just curious as to how many people have actually traveled to Cuba from here before. If you could just raise your hand, give me an idea. Okay, so like many of my colleagues who complain about the, what the future will be, um, I uh, will just share a little bit about my own experiences. My first trip was in 1994. I took a group of 23 writers, museum directors, and curators, and artists with me to, from a conference in Miami. Uh, and then later in 2006, I was actually able to raise money to go back and organize a series of exhibitions. Uh, I was the first person to bring Los Carpinteros to New York, uh, Estereo Segura, additionally uh, to work with Carlos Caracoa, an artist who I've done many projects with over the years and having invited him to, to to work on a residency at Art in General when I worked there in New York. Uh, I've been very involved in organizing various different projects. This particular project that we're doing is really about exposing two different cities and sharing the similarities between both cities, uh, as many of you have already set, shared in your talks. Uh, in the early 20th century, New York City and Havana were connected uh, quite well. It's quite uh, many parallels are seen on a regular basis in walking uh, in the streets of New York, even to this day, and making connection to architecture in the streets of uh, uh, of Havana. Um, I uh, this this past December, I landed in December 17th in Cuba when the U.S. and Cuba announced that they will have relations. I know everyone thinks that this project is part of the U.S. announcement, but actually we've been working on this for the past two years. This is a dream I've had since the very beginning. Now I'm going to share some uh, images and talk a little bit about the project. 
in general. So the Bronx Museum, here you see Architectonica. We own two buildings. One building is the site of a former synagogue and then 2006 we were able to open this new. It was the first uh, design, uh, museum designed by Architectonica. So. Uh, much of the museum's focus is uh, public programming, also education. We are a museum focused on contemporary art. Uh, we also are free admission, and the attendance grew after announcing free admission uh, from 25,000 people up to 76,000 people currently. So it's been a, a huge opening. Uh, I share with you uh, Los Carpinteros, an early work from 2000. And three, Embaja Rusa, which is an exa example of the embassy in Russia in Miramar here in Havana. It's actually uh, carved woods uh, uh, that they designed. And this was part of a, an exhibition that we worked on for several years called Beyond the Super Square, where we explored art, architecture, and modernism and the parallels. Carlos Garacó, as I mentioned, he's an artist who uses architecture, art, photography, installation. This is a wonderful book, uh, pop-up book that, uh, that he did using uh, both printed paper, cardboard, and plastic. And uh, he's done a series of four different books. This was also included in the exhibition Beyond the Super Square. And he's part of the permanent collection at the Bronx Museum. The focus of the permanent collection is really in uh, many different areas, but in particular, uh, artists who are exploring urban life. This particular work uh, shares uh, the future life of, of or how architecture will be seen in Havana. Ana Mendieta, many of you might know her, uh, her work anyway. She was extremely important Cuban-American artist who went back in the 80s uh, um, in the early 80s before she died to make a series of works. Uh, her work is very much grounded in the body and uh, creating a group of silhouettes and natural landscape. She had done a huge public artwork in the Haruko, which is a national park in Havana with a series of works. These are photographs. She's also uh, done a series of documentations with videos and this work uh, will also be sent to Havana. Tanya Bergera, many of you might be following her on Facebook, as you might know, she did an art demonstration in the Plaza Revolution and is under house arrest in Cuba as we speak. This is a very early work that she did on the steps of the university, and um, it was actually performed as well in Canada. And the video documentation is part of the Bronx Museum's collection uh, as well. Uh, so the exhibition uh, shares the idea of two cities and how they work differently and sharing many commonalities. Uh, and Wild Noise really has uh, been put together by a team of four people and a huge um, group of uh, people in production as well. Uh, you can just imagine how complicated it is to transfer artwork um, between the United States and Cuba. So Willie Cole, many of you might know his work or not, he did an amazing piece called How Do You Spell America? Uh, this is an old chalkboard, blackboard, uh, with uh, uh, writings, and this will be exhibited at the, at the uh, National Museum. Huma Baba is a wonderful artist from Karachi, Pakistan, and she uh, uses um, and combines both drawing, painting, and uh, photography, and is very well known for her uh, public artworks as well as sculpture. This will also be exhibited. Vito Conchi, Bronx-born artist, well known from the 70s, who uses texts and photo-based work. This is a wonderful work that I found uh, out recently. Uh, an artist named Lazaro Saavedra, who lives and works in Cuba, actually did an early performance piece based on this image, but has never actually seen the photograph. So this will be the first opportunity 
for many of the artists in Cuba to encounter um, much of this uh, artwork that, that really hasn't been shown. Rigoberto Torres, a wonderful artist from Puerto Rico who grew up in the Bronx. This is actually a cast of Days, the graffiti artist, uh, also a local uh, artist from, from the uh, Bronx as well. And um, so there will be almost 90 works. Mary Mattingly, as you can see from the image on the top, her work is called Pull, and she's an artist who creates interventions using all kinds of um, green energy and, and collecting all kinds of recycled materials and creating sculptures. She will uh, create a, a work in a park, and this is the US artist that will be going to Havana to create a new work. And then Umberto Diaz, also an artist, a sculptor, really from the 2000s generation in, in Cuba, who, who has not yet been able to travel to the US. And we're hoping to bring him uh, next year, and he'll be creating a work on site at the Bronx Museum uh, outdoors. This is a, a wonderful sculpture that he created based on tsunami, um, and uh, he does very large-scale outdoor public works working with architecture as well. Uh, the Teen Council Exchange. So the teens at the Bronx Museum often uh, work with other cities and teens, and uh, we've made a partnership between the Bronx Museum's teens and the teens in Havana. So the, uh, the museum does not have a teen council, so we're helping the museum in Havana actually create a uh, teen council and um, really very much interested in the local neighborhood around the museum. They're in Old Havana as well as very close proximity to Centro Havana and teens have been uh, cr uh, collecting all kinds of objects both in the Bronx and then have been transported to Havana. Havana teens have uh, collected objects from the streets and then transported them. They're working in all kinds of cross dialogue. We have a team of people on staff that have been able to go uh, back and forth, and they will be uh, creating all kinds of workshops. Mary Mattingly also has been working with the university students and creating uh, many architecture workshops with students as well, and um, we're really happy about these partnerships. So in, in general, I think that this has been a, an amazing experience. Uh, we have a long haul to go. Uh, opening as one show and then uh, being able to bring the work to the Bronx Museum uh, is, is another process. Uh, and I, I think that so far um, we're, we're getting closer and closer. I'll keep you posted in terms of the opening and how uh, artwork is actually going to manage to make the boat. Um, understand that there's only one transportation system that works between Miami and Cuba, and there's only one boat that transports artwork back and forth. So I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to a, an interesting dialogue uh, after with uh, my fellow panelists. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Hernán Díaz Alonso, who has been very close to uh, friends uh, with, us, with me and uh, in Argentina, and uh, I think it's going to make uh, Sayark rock in the next uh, years, um, the new director of uh, Sayark. And thank you for this opportunity uh, when he called me to see if I could speak about this. Uh, I really, I, I really thought uh, that uh, I had no reason to be here. But uh, uh, then I thought, well, 
you know, pieces of my bi bi biography that were not say before. I was married to a Cuban for 10 years, uh, and that has tre created enough trouble so that I could speak about Cuba. And actually, my son is in, in Havana right now. So at the beginning, I thought maybe I will do a an, an sort of action installation where I will try to contact him over the internet. And that will be it. But yeah, so, but it, it will not work. So it, it, it will fail. So um, um, then I, uh, I remembered that, um, you know, from those uh, days, um, I, uh, I did a project in Havana. Uh, I was contacted after I finished my studies in Germany and came back to Argentina. I was contacted uh, some way through uh, Dr. Roberto Segre, who was mentioned before, and who became uh, an extraordinary friend of mine. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, he died a couple of years ago in a very a sad accident in, in Rio de Janeiro where he was uh, teaching and, and researching and producing his new book that finally came up came out after uh, uh, he, de he died. Um, and uh, so I uh, finally had the chance, you know, a dream as many other Latin American uh, young people to go to Havana. Uh, you know, you have seen uh, motorcycle diaries and things like that, and you know that, uh, you know, Che Guevara is uh, uh, somewhere, everywhere in Latin America still. And, um, and his travels and his ideals and, and you know, and the way to, uh, to think about Latin America as, as this place that could be. Um, so I was very excited, very hopeful about uh, going to uh, do a, a job there and meet uh, the people uh, of, uh, of Cuba that, you know, we all know the Cuban people are Cuba. Um, everybody says Cuba is phenomenal, it's interesting, it's, uh, uh, it's sad, but uh, the people of Cuba are wonderful. So. Um, I wanted to, to, to get in touch with that. And uh, finally, I had the chance to do this uh, little project uh, in, in Havana, and in the old Havana, um, invited by the, or uh, in, in touch with the uh, Oficina del Historiador, um, uh, of Eusebio Leal, and the tal Talier de Arquitectura at that time. Uh, I knew it was going to be uh, just a try, and uh, that's what it was. Uh, it was a very nice try to probably contribute to the general confusion. Um, and, uh, and obviously it didn't go further, but it was a nice attempt during two years to communicate, to, do, uh, to think together, and to um, travel back in 98. I arrived in, in 98 after two years, the day that the Pope was arriving to Havana. So it was very confusing, I could tell you. Uh, you know, to see the, 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 the Revolution Square with Jesus Christ and Che Guevara together uh, was, was uh, phenomenal. Uh, anyway, in one of my travels uh, during the first time, uh, I visited, obviously, the, uh, the uh, Che Guevara's uh, um, monument in Santa Clara and appeared this little piece that fascinated me. Uh, which is a letter that uh, Ernesto Che Guevara wrote to his uncle, to, uh, to his uncle in, in, in Cordoba, in Argentina, where he was born. He was born in Rosario, where Hernán was born, uh, or in, yeah, or in Mar del Plata. Anyway, from Rosario, um, and uh, because he had asthma, he had to be in the mountains um, in order to be able to breathe, to breathe normally, and and uh, he was, you know, seven years old, seven years old writing uh, letters to his uncle asking for books uh, to read. And at the end it says, uh, get a hug from Ernestito. And that's the signature of Ernesto Che Guevara. So I saw the whole Latin America there in that signature. I saw the whole dream of uh, independence, of, you know, of uh, revolution. Um, 
from the first colony, from what they call the second colony, and so on. Um, and I read uh, Alejo Carpentier at that time. I, I learned about uh, the marvelous real idea, how the, the real is so real in Cuba that becomes almost fictitious, that becomes something that you can't believe. And uh, so, and becomes magical, becomes something that, uh, you know, surpasses the reality. Um, so from there on, uh, what I showed at the beginning is that I'm going to show, uh, how does that work? Does it work? I'm going to show uh, this project here and that project over there. So they are very old projects, but that's what's related to, uh, to, this, to this night. Um, at that time, I was given the opportunity to uh, select some sites in the old Havana. Um, together with uh, Shadira Rodriguez, who is somewhere there sitting. Um, <clears throat> and I choose this uh, site um, in the corner, um, in the corner of uh, Leonor Perez and San Ignacio. Um, that was uh, one of those corners that were mentioned before, that what those corners that collapse, uh, typically after the storms because of uh, many structural issues and lack of maintenance and uh, uh, many other reasons. And uh, those places normally stay open and uh, they have been renovated as playgrounds or other sorts of uh, commer little commercial developments for the old city of Havana, uh, but mostly they remain open. And um, m many of them have, you know, scaffoldings to support them. Uh, that was very interesting to to know um, also other buildings around not to collapse. Uh, so we started from there. Uh, the, 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 the team wanted to do a, a playground um, as well with uh, some housing development of the, on the top, you know, to the top of it. So which was a very strange combination of programs. You know, a playground in the bottom, uh, public, uh, little public housing on top. So it was the first attempt, the, you know, the very schematic uh, design uh, phase that uh, we went through. But, you know, I was interested in, in this. I was interested in, in this. I was interested in the very precarious uh, conditions of the architecture in, in Havana, and not to be, you know, uh, ambitious about preservation and about, you know, uh, reconstruction or restoration because there was nothing there. But what was there is the dreams for a playground, the dreams for a new house, and, you know, the reality which surpasses uh, every fantasy there. I was also interested in one of my visits, I experienced the 1st of May, Fidel is somewhere there, uh, you know, before the Jose Marti monument. Um, and uh, I experienced one of those parades, you know, that no, typically you imagine, you know, airplanes and tanks and things like that, but there were people pushing, you know, something like, like a statue of wood uh, with Camilo. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, it's really amazing that to survive, and it's really amazing the hope to survive. No, you need to understand that. Um, when uh, Universo was showing the projects, I was thinking, uh, to be an architect in Cuba is, is really an incredible exercise, because you can't project anything. You know, you can't imagine, because there is no future uh, whatsoever, unless now there are some, you know, uh, talks, but that's it, there are titles of uh, future. But uh, to be an architect, thinking that something may happen in the future, it's, it's a really tough, uh, it's a really tough, I mean, we all think about that. We all think in the future something may happen, but to think that may not happen at all, and that probably it will happen now, but that, you know, when you talk to somebody, to, you know, it's always, uh, they say, you know, I want to see a change one day, no? What was said before. 
And, uh, but everybody says, I'm not going to see a change there, okay? So anyway, uh, this is a typical, you know, entry to a housing building with all these, you know, improvised uh, electrical installations and so on. So I was interested in that. I was interested in the real marvelous. I was interested in the, um, let's say, the, uh, the, the, the capacity of, 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 of the reality become almost baroque. You know, something that uh, Latin America embraced for, for a long time. You know, what was called also in literature the new, the new world baroque, you know, after Alejo Carpentier which is the, you know, this uh, proliferation of imagination based on the reality, based only in the reality. So this is the project I did at that time. Uh, we, if we go back to this, uh, I call the project the Great Sioux. At that time, um, this is not the book I found at that time, but uh, this is a fantastic book on the Great Sioux by Nicolas Guillén. Nicolas Guillén, you know, uh, probably the most important uh, poet in, in Cuba, uh, wrote uh, these extraordinary Afro-Cuban Afro poems, you know, based on sound and uh, also on, uh, on ideas. But in 19, 1967, he wrote this book, which was really, uh, a shift in his uh, in his trajectory, um, which is um, well, 1967, the the year that Ernesto Che Guevara was killed in Bolivia. Um, but this is a very ironic book. You can see here, you know, the orangutan with the with the U.S. you know uh, grades of the uh, military here. So it's a very extraordinary book. I could pass it later. And the illustrations here are different than the ones originally by uh, Fayad uh, Hamis, uh, but very, very extraordinary illustrations. And uh, um, I was fascinated with the, the great zoo that he presented, because this great zoo is, uh, you know, in the, in the tradition of the bestiarios, the bestiariums in literature, this is a bestiarium. It's a, it's, it's a collection of beasts, uh, beasts that, uh, you know, most of them are imaginary, but, uh, you know, some of them are real. Uh, here, the orangutan, the, 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 um, the monkey, and some others, the tiger, are real, but most of them are imaginary. You know, there, there, are, there is a, a cage for guitars, and there is another cage for clouds, and there is another cage for uh, uh, Syrians and things like that. It's, 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 it's an amazing book. But as in the bestiarios, the animals are meaningful, you know? They represent or they refer to something. Like in the old bestiarios, um, you know, the pelican was Jesus, Jesus and things like that. So in this case, obviously, there is reference to the U.S. and the uh, imperialism and, you know, very many political ideas. Um, but it's, it's amazing. It, it, you know, it flourishes with, uh, mostly with Cuban, you know, with Cubanity, with Cuban people, every single world. Um, so I was interested in that. And um, so we decided, because I proposed the, the Great Sioux, uh, we called it the great, the, the, the great Latin American Sioux uh, because everything in, in Cuba, you know, used to refer to Latin America as the potential for the expansion of the revolution. So, um, so we decided to work on something that is very, you know, uh, deep for us, which is the, the Nazca lines, the, you know, the lines that are uh, engraved in the uh, in the desert in, in Nazca, in Peru, and uh, with the animals and all the story related uh, to that, and uh, take that as the inspiration of, you know, uh, uh, this uh, great zoo that will reunite, you know, Latin American ideals and people. So, um, but it was just a 
you know, to start. So we basically developed a series of, uh, uh, you know, uh, furniture, how do you call, uh, you know, uh, playground furniture for kids with, you know, uh, very many animals that uh, had some kinetic, very simple movement to it. Uh, and the housing project on top, which was following the scaffolding uh, that uh, we were seeing in the streets of Havana. As you can see here, these are very basic drawings of that time because it wasn't uh, developed much farther. Obviously, this project didn't pass the, any of the uh, historic preservation committees and so on. Um, but, uh, so uh, this is a site plan for you to understand, you know, this is, obviously, this is all old Havana and we have the cathedral, you know, and the main uh, uh, religious buildings and there is this little church uh, here that, uh, that is uh, right next to the harbor uh, creating this uh, cross in, in, in the city of Havana and that's the location of the building in front of the, of the church. So basically that was the, um, the, the housing project uh, uh, attached to the, uh, the, to the two walls uh, of the neighbors uh, to basically to support these other two walls and uh, free completely the ground, right? That was, um, and this is the first attempt to make the, uh, the monkey and the, the bird and the, and the, and the, uh, um, the fox and the uh, uh, waterworks with the, with the fish. I mean, it was a very, let's say, very naive project, very, uh, very optimistic project. And that's what y you still can get, even the, the, the Berlin Wall fell, you know, some years before that. And the, the, the big crisis in Cuba was going on, the Periodo Especial. Um, it was, at least for me, it was still optimistic uh, to be um, displaying this possible future for the kids of, of Havana. So it was a very, a very fun project. It was my version of the bestiarium. Um, and then, since it happened, you know, many years, since, since 1996, uh, the other day, uh, having a conversation with uh, a student of mine, uh, Lucy Navarro, who might be somewhere there, um, I, I, I decided to, to work with her and, and collaborate on making these three collages that uh, in a way will display those three phases of the project, uh, actualizing them to today. This is the first one where we wanted to populate, you know, uh, with this uh, zoo, the corner of, uh, of uh, that, that particular corner uh, with, you know, some of the, uh, you know, the representations of Nicolás Guillén, Great Sioux, the gangsters. There is, a, there is a cage for gangsters in the Great Sioux of uh, Nicolás Guillén. Uh, obviously, there is a crocodile, cro 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 crocodile. Um, you know that the crocodile is, is, is representing normally Cuba, um, and, uh, and so on. Uh, obviously, there is a Sputnik cosmonaut coming from the, you know, the Soviet Union into the place. Um, then, you know, maybe this is the sort of present, you know, where people still play chess, you know, in the corners because there is not too much to do. And, you know, this kind of sad uh, feeling, uh, everything, you know, even though it's working and it's going further, and as we saw with the universal, it's hopeful, you know, things are still falling apart. And anyway, and then this probably, uh, you know, that guy riding the crocodile, hopefully not. Uh, you know, people attacking the, uh, uh, the, the Capitolio, the replica of the, of the Capitolio in Washington. Um, you know, again in 50 years probably, and, and, and Che Guevara's signature coming out of the, of the Capitolio, which today is a museum, you know, it's not the Congress building. Um, 
uh, Ernesto Che Guevara is still flying around there. I mean, um, so um, this was a little bit about the project, but uh, uh, the real from there came some years later, um, and I will go faster, in 2007, uh, when because of all this, um, I was called by the city of Rosario to do uh, a monument, not a monument, but a square, a memorial square for Che Guevara's 80th uh, birthday in Rosario, in Argentina, um, because there was no agreement on how to do it, and there were many political battles around it. And I was called uh, almost like two months before the opening, okay, uh, to do the project. Uh, you can imagine what was that. Uh, it was very difficult. We had to work with the unions, and we had to work with the uh, also with the with the, uh, the the embassy of Cuba in Argentina. So uh, I decided to collaborate with uh, two friends, two great friends, uh, Jose Antonio Choi from Havana. Uh, you know, probably one of the most renowned architects in Havana today. Uh, and Dr. Roberto Segre, as I mentioned. Roberto Segre is a, was a very particular character, very controversial, uh, and I want to make an homage to his, uh, you know, uh, wild character. Uh, he was born in Italy, he was raised in Argentina in Buenos Aires, and then he joined the revolution, uh, as many other intellectuals did in Latin America in 1959, and created the Department of History in the school. And then he stayed there for 30 plus years. Um, then he left and came back uh, uh, from time to time to, to, to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, but he was, a, he was a very, very active intellectual. Um, and the landscape architect, Lucia Esqueva Pietra. So uh, this is what we got at that time. Uh, I'm showing this because I, we actually worked following some of the ideas because we had no time. We had to do a workshop in three days, uh, agree with the politicians and the unions, and start construction in two months opening. Um, and actually, when we came to the site, uh, you know, they were working on the site already, doing another project that the municipality proposed before that was not going further, but the machines were still working. And we found this. I'm not going to show the whole process, but uh, Basically, what we had was a problem. Because a sculptor from Buenos Aires, Andres Cerneri, um, donated a, a, a statue of Che Guevara. Um, that was not actually produced, it was an idea for the statue. Um, and the city of Rosario accepted that uh, statue, and then they wanted the square to surround the statue, you know? And uh, it was terrible because, you know, the discussion was impossible. I mean, Ernesto Che Guevara will, n will never want a, a statue of him, uh, and especially the way it was designed the square before, uh, you know, leading or on top of the, of the crowd. And uh, the discussion with the sculpture was very, very, very strong because even in, in writings of Che Guevara, he was opposed to the, so, the socialist uh, realism and the representation of the leaders. So anyway, but the project had to move on and, uh, and Che Guevara had to be there, so we proposed that, uh, you know, everybody remembers Che Guevara in, in, in Cuba as this guy who worked with the people. I mean, uh, more than the leader that was detached. So these are pictures that are always, you know, depicting him with the people, you know, in the, uh, in the sugarcane plantations, you know, uh, um, showing how to work there, or embracing the, the, the you know, the, the parades or something, work, uh, walking with them and so on. So that's what I wanted to do. I don't know if you could see something there. But um, we finally came to an agreement, especially with the politicians. We wanted to do uh, the signature because it was the anniversary of his birthday. It was not the celebration of the of the of the you know of the the guy that we know. It was the celebration of his birthday. You know, the kid that had dreams. Okay, so we proposed to do a cloud of lights, like in any celebration uh, in a in a place like this, uh, with his signature, and to make a place for the people to to meet, with no statue. 
but the statue had to be there, the cloud was removed. So we finally came to an agreement because the politicians saw in the excavation that they were doing and that we redrew, we saw, uh, somebody saw the map of Latin America. So we said, perfect. So if that's the map of Latin America, we could put Che Guevara in Cuba. We don't need to put him there. So we actually separated the, the statue of Che Guevara here, and we reused the base of the uh, Great Sioux project uh, to do the base of the, of the, um, of the, um, of the statue. So this, the, the base of the statue is a series of planters, actually, that will grow the, um, the, uh, the, the, the cane, and uh, in, in some time, it will cover completely the statue and make it make it disappear finally because it was horrible. Um, so, but uh, not because we didn't want the statue, we wanted the statue to be attached to the landscape. Anyway, uh, it was executed very quickly, not exactly as it was planned. Um, the people actually embraced very much the statue, uh, still there, uh, but also uh, the, the, the square became a square became a square for the people to meet uh, and look at each other and, and, and celebrate. So uh, what was incredible was the opening. Because Ernesto Che Guevara's uh, sister came, and it was amazing because you always see Che Guevara, you know, 30 something years old. And suddenly you see Che Guevara 80 years old, you know? Uh, and then, he died already, the guy that traveled with uh, Che Guevara in the motorcycle that is depicted in the, in the motorcycle diaries uh, was also there. It was a very, very emotional um, celebration of the life of uh, Che Guevara in Rosario, which was very brief. He was born there and moved somewhere else. Anyway, this is uh, Che Guevara's son, and this is Che Guevara's daughter, and the picture we have. So this is Roberto Segre, the day of the celebration. Uh, Jose Antonio Choi, the, 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 uh, the uh, Cuban architect and, he, and his wife. Uh, Lucia Escava Pietra, the opening, and the people came and really took over the, the situation. It was a fantastic celebration. You know, the work completely disappeared. And Che Guevara was embraced, was hugged by the people in a very particular way that I will show. But, you know, this told me something about that, and it's that the people will make it, you know? Uh, hopefully, we will see the people of, uh, of Havana expressing their thoughts and the way uh, it should go. Uh, hopefully, there will be no more monuments to intervention. And, um, you know, and hopefully, the people of, uh, of, of Cuba uh, will have a future again. Um, this is the, the little video I did with a very crappy uh, phone, but this is how it became. The people jumped into the, into the statue, embraced it, and, and did this. Something very Argentinian, very, very Latin American. Can you see the statue there? It's somewhere there. But we, you know what, what was the fight about? Why, why the people were jumping all around him? because they were fighting, there is a, an historic fight in Rosario, which is Che Guevara was from Rosario Central or New Wilson Boys, two soccer teams. So these guys put the, the, the flag of Rosario Central around him and conquered the statue for one of the teams. So this is how, you know, uh, our reality surpasses any fantasy. Thank you very much. So I'd like to invite all our panelists to join us on the stage. We're going to, um, in the interest of time, it's a bit late, but we'd like to just take one question for each of the panelists and then open up for a brief conversation with the audience. I guess I'd like to just, I'd like to begin, is this working? Yeah. Um, by asking a question, uh, it applies to several of the panelists, um, maybe specifically uh, to Belmont. Um, 
In terms of a recent article that you wrote in Places Journal, uh, History of the Present Havana, a fantastic article. For those of you who uh, have not looked at that, definitely check out Belmont's article in Places. Um, and you talk about, and you brought it up tonight in the talk, a kind of progressive um, preservationist strategy. I think it, it does tie in also to Universo's uh, display of the work from the students in Havana. Um, how one can sort of begin to engage with this very rich urban fabric uh, to kind of protect that, but at the same time to move forward and not turn the city into a kind of ossified uh, museum. Well, I'd say that I, w I was very encouraged by seeing the uh, work, uh, the student work, uh, work out of the university that Universal was showing because it, it uh, displayed that kind of uh, willingness to inject contemporary new thinking and form making into the historic city. Um, I find myself always sort of arguing against the um, historic preservationists uh, from outside of Cuba who you know, talk about how are we going? How are we going to save Havana? How are we going to preserve Havana? Well, how about the Cuban people take care of Havana? And um, the city needs change. It needs development. It needs um, new buildings. I love the idea of how it needs tall buildings too, just to sort of um, complete the project of the 1950s that was giving such strong definition to certain parts of El Verado. And by what I mean is by progressive preservation attitudes is just not being so precious and not uh, going the, uh, you know, the route of, 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 of trying to, 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 to cast Havana in amber, but embrace the opportunities for modern intervention in, into the city. And I think that uh, you know, with people like Universo teaching at the university there, and um, with with just the, the 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 longing, the necessity for um, modernization in Havana, that you know maybe maybe there can be a new example set of um, you know having respect for and preserving the the historic city fabric, but not being afraid of of, of modern interventions. Yeah, uh, just to build on that, I have a question for you, Holly, but for you, uh, Universa, I gotta say what you presented, it was not exactly what I expected, uh, and I say that in absolutely the most positive way. Um, uh, like you, Belmont, I'm often bothered by preservationist attitudes, and, it, and, and because I think they're often counter to what they're trying to preserve, that the preservation of a culture really, particularly within a an urban environment requires that they keep up with the pace of the rest of the world and that the local environment finds ways to adapt, to evolve. And while there's a sadness that we lose a lot of things, that loss is absolutely essential to the growth of the culture. And I think when we look as outsiders at places like Havana, we think that uh, there isn't that same kind of spirit. You know, we look. Uh, cluelessly thinking, oh, it's, it's, it's sad what's going on there. They must not be dreaming in the same way. And I, I just want to say uh, it was amazing to see that you're dreaming in the same way, you know, and I hope that those, uh, you know, I think, I hope that what's happening recently is, is ultimately a sign that you'll see some of those come to fruition. So I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm curious, Holly, about uh, knowing the amount of time that these things do take. It, it, it was kind of obvious that you had your, uh, this exchange planned before the announcement in December, but I'm curious, does this change anything? What, what does it mean now, you know, when this, because I, I assume when you began planning this, you had no idea that this, there was gonna be uh, this kind of, at least, talk of opening up, but it, it must change what the take is. Are you scrambling to, to deal with that? Or? Um, I wish I could say that actually funding would open all doors, but that's not the case in the U.S. Uh, intersection. Our new embassy is still trying to figure out like what kind of cultural activities they will actually support and if there is going to be money there. I think under the Clinton administration with the people-to-people -people exchanges in 2000, we were as close to it 
you know, of the U.S. giving money to the Havana Biennial and actually supporting culture, um, but nothing has happened. What's interesting also is to know that under the Bush administration, while we had the largest um, trade relations with Cuba uh, under that time period, we had so few cultural exchanges during that eight-year period. I mean, it was really, that's why many of the visual artists from the 90s actually ended up going to Europe and having second cities. Uh, it's not a foreign idea to be able to figure out how to live in two worlds. Uh, and it's, it's, it's for the ones that actually have the permission to leave and, or to, uh, to travel. Um, I think another thing that happened with the cultural community on the Havana side is in the last five years that many artists have been able to actually obtain a three to five year visa, uh, which has allowed them to travel more extensively. Um, I think that uh, one thing to th also think about is that uh, for years we really haven't had a curatorial selection of U.S. artists showing in Havana. It's really been artists who have had the money and financially have supported themselves. So if cultural institutions are working together in partnership, we have a hope that we'll be showing great U.S. artists in Havana and great, you know, uh, artists from Cuba to be able to come here, and that—that's really about the whole cultural exchange process. Uh, yes, my, I have a question uh, for you, Universo. Um, it seemed that in, in showing the work that there's the student work that there's still a, a strong interest, or let's say, legacy of modernism to couple um, climate performance with uh, a contemporary architectural form making. And what you might imagine, let's say changing, I know I can't, I can't help but get away from this issue of what's gonna change, what's you know, next, but how, might, how, how you might speculate um, teaching that as things unfold? First, it was too difficult to decide what to show here. <laughs> But uh, the same uh, motivation of the symposium, Havana, what's next, uh, should uh, decide me in showing the hope, which has hope in some. <coughs> I'm considering myself a very lucky architect in Cuba. Because after graduation, I remodeled the Hotel Nacional. It's a symbol of uh, architecture in Havana. I was five months gradu graduated and my tutor was uh, ill, cancer, and the boss decided to uh, assign me the principal of that work. Image was my real school of architecture, <laughs> leading with everything, landscaping, interior design, exterior, uh, everything. But it was a huge thing of good professional, all people helped me, and finally, uh, things uh, 89 to 92 was uh, not only remodeled but uh, just rescue that uh, treasure in Havana. W what I want to say it in my practice, I uh, all the time uh, had the possibility to lead with uh, rehabilitation. Hotel Telegraph in the Central Park in Havana was an intention, uh, an express intention of showing the contemporaneity was 1998. Uh, we and my wife, we were together, uh, of course, in a government enterprise, because in Cuba, the individual practice is not allowed. We all architects have to work in huge government offices, which the half of the architect of engineer have not, nothing to do, but I'm dedicated to my profession all the time, uh, 25 years, 26, exactly. Um, we somehow, my wife uh, work at the historian offices uh, of rehabilitation. I work at the office of the Minister of Construction. Somehow we lead to uh, get that project. Uh, hotel Telegrafo was the first hotel in Havana and was the, the only emptiness surrounding the Central Park because a few years uh, before was built a Hotel Parque Central. And eclectic reinterpretation of the past in some, some strange codes, but there is. 
and was a resort the hotel Inglaterra, one of the few hotels. Um, you know, it's a central part of uh, uh, the connection in between the old Havana and the new Havana. So in my practice, uh, before even teaching in the School of Architecture, I teach since 2007, uh, I uh, acquired a huge sensibility with the heritage, leading with the heritage. I know that a whole Cuba needs to be preserved somehow. Preservation is not only physical, but it's most of all in our minds. Maybe just memories of something like used to be there. Hotel Telegrafo was an intention of showing the change of times in between the 20th century and the new age, which had saved uh, an old ruins, twice burned, and um, somehow leading with new shapes, just corpses introducing into the arches in ruins to show a new time. And outside, the uh, commission of monument uh, didn't allow that to develop a concept of just two stories original and then glass, blue glass, representing both times. So I consider that uh, education and leading with the students uh, in the faculty, in the School of Architecture in Havana, it's just a, a consistent effort uh, of keeping memory about art architecture, about heritage. You know, in the first, in the second workshop with my student, I teach at the third course, tall buildings, then in fourth course, uh, rehabilitation and interior design. I, uh, first question I make is, uh, how many of you are planning to leave the country after graduation? <laughs> Practically 90% of them. Um, really, 90% of all of architects who graduate in Havana, they are trying to live in the country because no future for them. It could be contradictory because what is my future? <laughs> I'm also an architect. But realistically speaking, there is just a few, few spaces for practicing architecture. But no matter. Uh, wherever they go after graduation, maybe to the States to wash dishes, you know? It's not easy to work like architect for a Cuban anywhere. There is a very important architect, young architect, Bedoya, who draw the most beautiful draws from Havana with ink point. They're selling everywhere. He left to Madrid and he died just in the park, freezing, frozen. It was very sad history, you know? But anyway, uh, we used, I used to say, it's not the same, the half full glass than the half empty. It's the same quantity of water, but it's not the same concept. And I'm thinking all the time, keeping the hope uh, that is necessary to uh, keep the hope in the better future. No matter the sadness, Havana, the whole Cuba is very sad everywhere. On the streets, it's dirty. The whole building's just waiting for collapsing, practically. But anyway, we have to keep the hope in the better future, in the better possibility. I don't know if the opening with the states would be for better, because the huge investment could be killed the treasure we're keeping without any maintenance, without any resources. Some um, people uh, every time ask, asking me about the possibility with the new relationship with the states. I'm always answering that the huge problem is our problem, leading with uh, our own uh, stagnation of thinking for more than 50 years. Mm -hmm. I never, I never, I think I would die with that answer to the question, why if the architecture means the physical memory of any uh, nation, our government, all the time, after spending the treasure on the, on the 60s, forgot about it. I don't figure it is because the embargo of American states. I don't feel it's because of the lack of resources. Because anywhere, all the time in my workshops, 
and training with the student in the use of local materials. Just concrete, just filling, just nothing. And we can lead with that. <clears throat> you can visit my works in Havana. For more than 10 years, I'm lucky to uh, rehabilitate several individual houses. And now I'm working in the whole Havana uh, in accommodation and restaurants for people that fortunately they are young couples working in foreign firms. They have enough money to buy some houses and they are uh, developing individual businesses. And it's interesting that uh, we don't have even uh, one quality material to develop any design project. But we somehow handle it with innovation, with imaginary, with some practicing non resources. And they are the works. And they are somehow, you said, hopefully something changed. And I'm sure everything is changing now. It's not a huge change, but everything is step by step changing. It's a, a huge risk, you know? I'm afraid of. I, all those years, I studied in the Soviet Union. I, for a, a kid, I don't have a memory, but I wanted to be an architect, I, I wanted to study abroad. And um, when I was finished the high school, I received a, a fellowship to study architecture in Almaty, the former capital of Kazakhstan. This evening, I was very lucky because uh, I take part of your reviews with the first course. And after finishes the review, some student come to me, came to me and he said, I'm from Kazakhstan. <laughs> <laughs> so you are here, people from Kazakhstan. So, <laughs> uh, well, uh, the thing is that uh, leading with heritage, leading with the uh, situation with the openness of relationship with the states, dealing with education of the future architects. There is only very passionate, utopic dream about possibility of everything now and in future. Thank you, Universal. I think that's, I mean, I think th th tonight, I mean, I wish we had even more time so we can have a longer conversation, but um, we'll, this is the last question and then we're going to open it to the public. Uh, so my question is for Claudio, uh, and it's going to be in Spanish, and I'm, I'm joking, <laughs> in Argentinian Spanish. Um, but following up, well, uh, two, two points, one from um, Universal and another one for Bel from Belmont. So I did some, num some numbers. So. Um, I wanted to talk about, about the role of modernization, uh, but the word modernity, um, and that word modernity somehow took me back to international style, modernism. I mean, it's like somehow modernism, that's like the core of how you see um, modernity in, in architecture, at least how you see it in um, Latin America. Um, international style ha has have had an incredible impact onto the growth of the cities um, in this country, but fundamentally in, in South America. And I mean, it came from, I mean, it became international style by an exhibition in, in New York in 1932. Uh, and El Vedado is, is started in, well, uh, some of the projects from 1959. Uh, that means that it took 27 years to modernity arrived to Cuba. And I, I don't want to mention in Argentina, maybe it took 10 more years, but you know, by the 50s, 40s or 50s. Um, so, I mean, it's a long journey, 27 years. Then another thing that Belmont was talking about also uh, is that since 1959, okay, of course, uh, we know what, what happened in 1959, but let's say that, that modernity stopped. Uh, or the international style stopped. Uh, so that means that to today, 2015, we have 56 years of, of a delay. So it took 27 years uh, to El Vedado, and it will take 56 years to what's the next step. I mean, I think that we're all here saying, like, I mean, what's next? Um, so it's a fantastic opportunity. I mean, even though that we see, I mean, all of the issues that are 
are taking place. But Belmont may make a, a, a great comment about the quality of entropy in the city of Cuba. And, and, and a question of how you can merge historical preservation and modern design. Um, and I think that's an incredible question and, and Universal showing the work of the students how, you know, I'm sure, I mean, the tall building is a, is a, is a, is a typology on itself. Um, but I think that Claudio's uh, project for the zoo is an interesting proposition to understand entropy and modernization in a way, somehow understanding the scale of the city and the future by looking at the present. I, I saw that project many years ago mm -hmm. um, in Rosario. <laughs> um, and so I, and I think, it, again, on the models and the drawings, I think it's a, it's a beautiful project of how it tries to engage. It's something that it seems that it could happen. I guess Universal could um, uh, echo that, but something that could be done in local <coughs> materials and, you know, um, so, so anyway, so, yeah. so my question was that, how entropy and modernization can yeah. work together. Well, the, um, we know also that uh, Latin America embraced modernism after a long period of somehow imposition of modernism in some way. Um, you know, when Le Corbusier came to Buenos Aires in 1929, it's like it was the seed where you know modernism expanded throughout uh, Latin America, but it took a long time to adapt and to become something completely Latin American. I mean, when you see the architecture of Sao Paulo in Brazil, it's different than, and, and it's all modern. It's different than the one in Chile, it's different than the one in Argentina, and it's different than uh, the one in Puerto Rico. Um, the issue is that, um, when Jose Luis Cert was bringing the plans of Le Corbusier to, to Cuba, uh, a little late, but he was bringing the plans of Le Corbusier for Cuba, it was a foreign office. I mean, it was a foreign office. It was a new imposition, and it was partially executed, right? Uh, it started to be executed, yeah, very little. And, um, and then, uh, you know, Everything stopped in 1959 uh, until today, uh, some way, uh, mostly. Um, so that process of adaptation, of, you know, of rethinking uh, culturally uh, the modernity, because the modernity had those ideals about you know, social uh, engagement, you know, social progress, and, and so on. Um, and that, in fact, happened throughout Latin America. I mean, uh, every architect in Latin America working for the government was communist at that time, right? I mean, from Niemeyer to Paulo Mendes da Rocha even today, or, you know, uh, Oscar Niemeyer died recently saying he and Fidel Castro were the last dinosaur communists in the world. Um, so uh, the idea of uh, modern architecture in Latin America is still there, um, and it's ours. It's not, it's, not, it's not American, I mean, it's not North American, it's not European, it's ours, it's Latin America. And, uh, and it's still going on. The difference is that we have had this possibility of adapting and recreating modernism in our way, you know? Working for the government, uh, you know, uh, making our ideas uh, flourish in the public field, making public space, you know, uh, rich and, 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 and feasible for our people. You know, I mean, Brasilia happened a couple of years after the revolution, right? And it's completely Brazilian. Um, the only thing that the Cuban government did uh, at that time was first taking over those buildings, right? I mean, the government moved to one of those buildings of the plan, of the third plan, and then started in two parallel ways that somehow created a synergy that could have followed. One was the Echeverria University, the school where you teach, uh, which is a fantastic piece of modern architecture, completely adapted to the climate, and you know, a phenomenal uh, adaptation of modern ideas, much more complex than any Corbus thought about you know, a, a building like that. Um, and on the other hand, 
well, we all know the schools of art uh, in Havana, which is a marvelous experiment that unfortunately, you know, it got stuck in time and then you did a, a great job following uh, up with that and uh, we still have a lot to learn from that because that's a, a clear experiment that we could do anything marvelous with almost no resources and that hasn't been done in Cuba since then. I mean, the School of Art is a great example. Uh, we keep you know, looking at it, learning from it all over Latin America, more recently, more recently. Uh, but, uh, so I think uh, Cuba could do that. I, uh, that's the future I see in Cuba, hopefully, is that, uh, you know, what you mentioned, uh, the possibility of looking at what they have and explore that and expand that and flourish that. Uh, together with, you know, modern life, uh, it's, it's a real possibility. So I think on that note, I, I think all of us wish that we had a bit more time uh, to talk about these issues, but I think we're going to continue the conversation in a more informal setting uh, over dinner with our panelists. We would really like to thank all of the panelists tonight for a very enlightening uh, set of presentations and conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.